actually Cowie-esque piece, really. It's concerned, after all, with the natural world and, of course, with bird life in particular. It also draws upon the formative experiences of 12 years spent living and working in Australia from 1983 to 1995. Edward Cowie, tell me a little bit about how and why that piece came to be written. Well, that, that, um, those moments we've just shared together um, were, in fact, my first visit to Australia before I lived there in 1981. Um, and I was taken to a very beautiful river valley in southern Victoria with a um, smoky, bushfire, blue, veined evening with these three extraordinary male lyrebirds calling. And it's literally, well, how long is that now? That's over over 20 years. Yes. Um, I dreamed, if you like, in that moment, because it was so beautiful, um, that there should be a moment when I could actually record it in, in music and transcribe, translate, relocate that spectacular performance by those birds for um, voices of another kind, the human voice, and that's what we've just listened to. Is your aim to actually imitate the bird song, or is it... Is it is it more to give an, a, a mood painting of it? Well, if there are any bird watchers here tonight, they'll certainly tell me no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although, although lyrebirds do make, and anybody who saw the lyrebird in David Attenborough's program, which featured the lyrebird making imitations of uh, camera shutters and, and chainsaws and so on, know that lyrebirds do do ch -ch and <laughs> noises, yes. um, which were, of course, incorporated in the three sopranos who beautifully sang those just now. Um, but no, I don't try to imitate the songs of birds. Um, I don't even transcribe them the way Messiaen did, whose music we're listening to a bit later on. Um, the birds themselves make shapes and sounds and evoke in me a sensation which makes me want to respond to them directly, but in my own way. Yes. That sense of wonder which you obviously have about the natural world mm. and glorying in creation, perhaps, it, is and has been, after all, a hallmark of many composers over the ages. Mm -hmm. It's a particular characteristic of the music of Michael Tippett. Now, earlier on, Michael Tippett was a very formative influence on you, wasn't, wasn't he? Oh, I think so. I mean, I, I met Michael when I was 21, um, and he was one of, the, one of the first people, other than Sandy Gurr, my teacher, mm. um, who really encouraged me to, to stay natural in every sense of the word. He, he did realize very early on that the living world, natural voices, natural sound were very important to me. Um, and subsequently, because he, he took me under his wing, um, I, I spent many, many wonderful evenings and, and days with Michael, walking in the countryside, appreciating that his philosophy, one of, of peace, uh, one of optimism and hope, was, as far as I was concerned, best manifested in um, expressing how wonderful nature was. We're not quite the same in musical languages, but we yeah. certainly were deeply both at home with the natural sounding world. And presumably talking about everything under the sun, because he was a, oh, great, yes. a great talker, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, one thing that both 